Good morning, everyone. I think it's time to start. Uh, so we have enough time to, to discuss all the interesting topics that we have today. So as you know, today we will be talking about constructive journalism in the environmental reporting. Uh, we will have uh, uh, Marie-Jose Daoud, MJ Daoud. Uh, she's a journalist and is a co-founder of uh, Lafnian Facts. And we will also have, as you know, uh, the journalist, the Lebanese journalist, uh, Marcel Mohamed and Karen Monser, who will be talking about the, uh, the articles they just published. So they will be sharing their insights about, uh, I mean, the creation process of their journalistic uh, uh, work. So I hope you have all the questions ready for them. Uh, for those of you that might be new to, to, this, to these gatherings, to, um, to this community, to the Amwash community, I wanted to give you a very quick context about what we do in this platform. And uh, so, as you might know, uh, some of you, Amwash is an initiative by Revolve. And Revolve is a communication group based in Brussels, in Barcelona and in Vienna. And ours is a Mediterranean water initiative. So we focus on uh, constructive and innovative communication around water and environmental challenges in the, that the Mediterranean region faces. And we try to inspire action towards sustainable water management and ecosystem restoration. So those are our focus and our targets. And I mean, that's the reason why we are also here today. So we want to inspire. <laughs> further action and further uh, impactful communication toward, towards these uh, challenges. You can explore in uh, our website, uh, the Tayarat section, that is like our community section to, to share your opinions, to um, stories and insights into the water, energy and ecosystems topics in the Mediterranean. It's open to any community members. So, so you, I mean, feel free to, to read what is in there and to, and to share, I mean, and to, to think of uh, topics that you could contribute, we will be happy to, to publish them. And you can also support and commit to protecting, restoring and enhancing the value of water ecosystems in the region by signing our manifesto. You can also find it in, in our website. The manifesto is available in five languages, so you can find it in Italian, in English, in Spanish, in Arabic, um, in French, yes. So, so yeah, feel free to also to, to read it and to sign it if, if you think that, uh, that it's pertinent. <laughs> and as I said, AMWASH, AMWASH aims to ensure reliable and impactful communication about the environmental challenges that the region is facing. We know they are many, and, uh, but we also know that there are many initiatives and many I mean, uh, individuals that are doing a great job to, to to I mean to tackle these challenges and to and to change uh, how the I mean situation is going and we believe that for that communication is very important and the narratives need to change uh, so I mean we know that it's a uh, hard work to do but uh, we think that the constructive journalism angle it's a powerful to powerful tool to do that. That's why we, we have been working uh, in the past uh, month with, uh, with this uh, group of Lebanese journalists that, uh, I mean, as you might know, uh, some of them are Karim and Marcel, but we have been working with, with many others. Some might be here also in, uh, in the audience today. Uh, we have been working along with uh, Beritech, which is uh, an incubator in, uh, in Lebanon to, uh, create more impactful, as I said, uh, communication around uh, agri-tech and uh, uh, energy topics in the in the in Lebanon specifically. But I mean, it can be extrapolated to to the region. Uh, for that, we we as you know, we organize the training with uh, this uh, group of journalists, and then we have been working along with them. Uh, we will have today the two winners. But uh, as you know, they are Marcel and, and Karim, but uh, we will be happy to, to hear from any other. And I don't want to steal more time to, to MJ. Uh, she will be giving us uh, insights on what is constructive journalism, what is, is a solutions journalism. Uh, we can find it in, in both names. And she will be explaining a bit more about how 
is the constructive journalism framing uh, applied and how it can uh, support uh, like changing this narrative as I, as I was saying. So MJ, if uh, you are ready, I will, uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you, Mike. Hello, good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, so just to give you a bit of background about myself. So I became a journalist in 2009 after a career in marketing. So that had nothing to do. And I covered business and economics in Lebanon for four years. And as you probably know, business and economics in Lebanon is not always funny. Um, it's, it's a lot of problems to, to cover and to talk about. And then I, I went abroad, I'd studied again. And then when I came back in Lebanon in 2015, I came back just at the time of the trash crisis. I don't know if you remember that, that crisis, but basically there were trash piling over all Beirut and Lebanon. And it was really hard to, to witness and to see. And I think it's one of the moments where I really felt powerless because you can't do anything about, I mean, I couldn't do anything about trash. But what happened, is that I realized that I had some of my friends and some people I knew who were taking things into their own hands and who were working on initiatives uh, to tackle the trash problem and the trash crisis. They were working on recycling initiatives, on sorting initiatives, on going and cleaning beaches, etc. And then I had a friend of mine who's also a journalist, her name is Soraya, who came to me and she was like, hey, both you and I, we know that there are lots of people who are doing good stuff in Lebanon and we never hear about them in the media. So why don't we create our own media where we can talk about the people who are trying to find solutions to everything and who are trying to bring people together? Because ultimately, that's also one of the things that solution journalism does is that it, it creates a better conversation. Um, and this is how in 2016, we started Lebne and Fact, which, was, which is a media and communication platform that aims to inspire Lebanese youth to create change. And it really came like we didn't even know what constructive or solution journalism uh, was at that time. We just did it because we felt the need to talk about the people who were doing change because it's also part of the reality. Yes, problems are here and they're, and they're real, but people who are working on solutions are also here and they're real too. So why are we only talking about one side of the coin, not about the other one? And so this is what we did for some time, um, actually for, for five years. We did an investigation on mental health, also bringing solutions, et cetera. And then um, when COVID happened, so last year, I mean, after uh, almost at the end of, of the two years of COVID, uh, as we know them, there was the Deutsche Welle Academy, so the German um, media, state media, who organized a visual constructive journalism fellowship so we were 14 photographers and video filmmakers from Africa and the MENA region working on solution inspired stories about COVID. And this is when I got the structured approach about solution journalism. Um, this is when I started really thinking with other people about what is solution journalism? How is it structured? How, it is, how is it processed? How do we do it in a more uh, structured manner and a more efficient manner? And just to make it sure there are basically two big institute of constructive or solution journalism in the world. You have the US one, the Solution Journalism Network, and then you have the Dutch one, which is a constructive institute. Uh, two different approach, very complementary. The one that, that um, I got or I followed was the American one, which is based on four pillars. Um, so the whole idea of solution journalism is that yes we talk about the problem but we're also talking about the solutions but it's not just feel good story or stories about stuff that can inspire without also saying what work and what doesn't work um so solution journalism is not communication it's journalism so we talk about what works and also what doesn't work so the four pillar pro approach the, defined by the solution journalism is by the Solution Journalism Network is divided into so four pillars, as I said. So you have the problem, but then you have the solution. It can be one or many solutions. It's obviously talking about the solution that a problem can have. You also have the evidence 
the how, I mean, this solution, does it work or no? And the evidence can be con quantitative, like so data, if you have it, um, but it also can be qualitative, so codes from people who are using the solution and um, experimenting how it works and how it doesn't work. Then you have what we call insight, which I call the recipe, is how does the solution work? And the idea of the recipe is that other people can read your piece or watch your, your, your piece and say, hey, maybe I can do the same thing in my community, in my country, in my, in my place. Like to give you an example, um, some times ago, there was an article about fog nets in Chile, if I'm not mistaken. So it was someone who put some nets who was capturing the water from the fog and was using this water to irrigate cultures. And this article, this piece of, of news got somewhere to an entrepreneur in Lebanon and they installed the same system in the mountains. Like this is the idea of the recipe, like how does it work? What, like, it, okay, it works in Chile, what do we need? We need fog, yes. So we have a place in Lebanon that's always foggy. So let's go there, let's install these, the, these mesh nets and then let's, let's collect water. So that's the recipe. And then the last part of the four pillars is uh, limitations. So what limits the solution? Because there are limitations like this, the, these fog uh, nets that wouldn't work if there is no fog, obviously. Uh, maybe you need a lot of them to produce a bit of water. Maybe it's very costly. Like, I don't necessarily know, but the whole idea is to say, hey, that's not necessarily a miracle solution. This is, sol this is a solution that works really well uh, in this kind of setup. And these are the limitations and what can we do about it? So four pillar, solution, evidence, insights, and limitations. Um, the insights and limitations are very important to say, hey, this is journalism. We're not communicating about how we're changing the world. I mean, we are because we're trying to inspire, but we are also saying what doesn't work and, and how it works. That's the journalism part. It's not just feel good story. It's real reporting and it takes time. It actually takes more time than just reporting on the problem because you have basically have to have both sides of the story. And one of the reasons solution journalism became really important, and I'm going to give you two main reasons. One of them is that people are tired of news, of bad news. We have what we call news fatigue. A lot of people just switch off the news because they're tired of um, being told bad news a day in and day out. It's tiring to only hear bad news. It's really tiring and it has an impact, a very important impact on mental health. So that's one of the main reasons. The second reason is that the audience is asking for solutions, like especially the younger generation, the, the under 35 year old. Um, I think there was a BBC report that said that more than 68% of the younger generation wants solutions with the problem that journalists talk about. They want to feel that they can do something about it or that other people are doing stuff about it. And as you know, like climate change is one of the major, is the major topic of the, this decade and is the major topic of interest for the younger generation. And if they don't have the clues or the tools to do something about it, and I mean, obviously they're going to feel anxious and depressed and nothing I mean, they will feel powerless, like they want to feel empowered. They want to feel that, hey, OK, we have this problem, but we can do something about it. So let's do it. Let's work together on this. Um, it, it's important to 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 bring in the solutions, because also, as I said at the beginning, solutions are also part of life. Uh, like every day you find solutions to little problems. Your car doesn't start, you will find a solution to make it start. You don't find fuel in Beirut or in Lebanon, you will call everyone to see if someone has fuel. Like our jobs as human being is to find solutions to all the problems that we face every day. So I feel at least that journalism should also reflect this complexity of life. And, and be about the problems and the solutions. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there, except if you have some questions and I hope I didn't ramble too much, but I hope that was clear. No, that was, that was very clear and uh, I mean, very, <laughs> very inspiring, I would say. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's very important what you were mentioning about the, the news fatigue, because mm -hmm. I think like, I mean, in this uh, current war and I mean, uh, 
where it seems that everything is bad and we are just getting bad news after bad news and everything is like short and snappy and uh, we just want to have the breaking news but we never go into like a bit more in depth and we are like a bit yeah fatigue, fatigue of bad news I would say it's not just news fatigue it's fatigue of bad news I think it's very important what uh, what the constructive journalism angle can 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 I mean can give uh, I would say it's also important what you were mentioning like I mean about the feel good news because I think it's something that it can maybe I don't know make people be not I mean not trust so much this constructive stories because they will be like uh, maybe this is just like feel good news like how are we really making the difference between this I mean more feel good like just happy stories or a constructive story like I don't know if you can elaborate a bit more on that and then I will give the floor if someone has has questions on the, on the audience Sure. Yeah, so actually, uh, it recently happened to me. Um, I was pitching the story uh, on corruption, actually, uh, into a media here. And I was clearly saying, like, we're doing a solution oriented approach. Like, it's like how to fight corruption. It's not about corruption in general, it's how to fight corruption. And the first comment that the editor in front was telling me is like, I don't believe in solution journalism. It just feels good. We have real problem here. I'm like, yeah, I know we have real problem. <laughs> But we also have real solutions uh, and these exist. And I'm not saying that the solutions are perfect because no solution is perfect. But in my article, I will say what works in the solution and will what doesn't work in my solution. Um, and it took me, I think, 20 minutes to convince them or to convince the editor that, hey, I'm not just going to do a feel good story or a hero story about someone coming with a perfect solution to corruption, because if that one existed, it would really make the world a better place. But I'm just going to talk about the small solutions that some people are developing to fight corruption in Lebanon. Um, obviously, we're going to explain the corruption problem here in, in Lebanon, how big it is, what it impacts. Uh, how bad it is, but we're also going to explain what are the solutions, what needs to be done for these solutions to be implemented, why some of these solutions work better than others, and what doesn't work. So th that was my answer to, to people who don't believe in solution journalism, who say that solution journalism is not journalism, it's just feel good story. It's like, no, it, it is really journalism, and it's even more rigorous journalism, or at least more complete, more complete journalism, because we talk about the problem, we explain the problem, but we also talk about the solution and we explain the solutions. And it's one of the things that one of my trainer used to say is why do you want to present only one side of the story? Like solution, you always have a solution to a problem. It's very rare that you don't have a solution to a problem. Sometimes you have solutions, but they're not implemented, which is another problem per se. But it's um, like, why would you only focus on one side of the story? That's always my answer. I think that's that's a good answer. Uh, so I don't know if uh, I mean if you have any questions, I, I just put it in the chat. Like you can just raise your hand or put it here in the in the chat, and I will, will pass it to MJ. Mm -hmm. I have a yeah question. So I mean about fact checking, like because that's a big topic. Like uh, that's a <laughs> that's a big thing and a very important thing on uh, when you're writing a journalistic piece, of course. Uh, mm -hmm how can i mean how are we ensuring that the information that you are adding in like those solutions i would say like that you're adding are reliable and that's i mean we can ensure that that's uh, that's yeah information is checked yeah um it, that's through journalism um through our job as journalists it, it's like one part of the solution journalism is finding evidence right and the evidence needs to be either qualitative or quantitative. In Lebanon, it's extremely hard to find reliable data. So having quantitative um, data is or evidence is pretty hard. But you can find people who use the solutions and um, who, who and for whom the solution worked or it didn't work. Like you can definitely find both. It takes time, it's investigation, it's reaching out to people, it's checking what works. Um, it, but it's like in journalism, when, when you study journalism, one of the first rules that they tell you is that um, you need to have two very independent, two different, two independent sources for something to be true. Like if something 
if you're checking on some news, uh, if I don't know, something happened, a car accident happened, to know what happened, you need to have two people who are completely unrelated who tell you the same thing so that it's a fact. Um, it's one of the rules that you can also apply with solution journalism. You need at least two different witnesses you who are not related, who are obviously not, um, how do you say, who are not stakeholders in, no, not stakeholders, who don't have interest in the solution, like not the owner of the solution, basically, but someone who uses the solution or who bought the solution. Um, it's just our job as journalists and investigative journalists, I guess. Thank I have you. a question from Ahmed. Well, I think he's having some problem with his microphone. So uh, he's saying presenting solutions with problems will not only bring back readers to be interested in the news, but uh, will also definitely inspire change in environment related stories. Can we talk about how important is the on site visit to help find solutions to the problem portraying the stories? Okay. I don't know if I really got the questions, but. <laughs> Um, and uh, if uh, so, I guess uh, how important is on site visit? So, I guess you are Ahmed, you're referring to like how important is the uh, like the field work, let's say, like going to visit the solution itself, like more, I mean, on site working than, yeah, okay. So, how yeah. important is to go out to the street, let's say, like I'm <laughs> talking like that, <laughs> no, like not just desk work, but going to meet the people, to visit uh, the solution, if you are talking about, uh, I don't know, like a agriculture solution that it's helping uh, certain uh, population, like, I mean, how important, I don't know if you have an answer for that, MJ, like. Uh... Uh, I feel like on-site visit or like field visits are important, kind of no matter the topic, uh, but in environment stories, like you you literally have the evidence in front of you if you go on the field if some solution is working somewhere i don't know to make a better irrigation you go to the place where it's installed and you see it with your own eyes and especially environment i feel is really prone to photo and video mm -hmm. so even if you're writing an article you could still take a picture of the solutions and post it with your article and then it will bring more evidence to what to the solutions and to what you're saying so yeah, and, and I also feel that one of the beauty of journalism is to go out there and meet people. Like it's uh, it's to go and meet new pe new places, new pe new people. So very important. Uh, field, field visits are important in journalism in general. In climate uh, reporting, they're even more not necessarily important, but accurate uh, because it's you will see it by yourself. Like you can play the part of uh, you can be a detective and go and check what works and what doesn't work. So. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess it also helps you to to see the reality, you know. Like I mean, mm. if maybe there's something that you can understand the solution from your desk, but you are not seeing where is it yeah. applied, so you are not really understanding the maybe the urgency or or like how okay. how impactful is is that solution in uh, in the field? Like where is it applied? Also, yeah. another important thing. I mean, we talked about like checking. We talked about I mean, of course, like field field visits, but it's. It's basic, as you say, like in journalism, like <laughs> that's one of the best parts, like going out there and talking to people. Mm. But uh, in that talking to people, we need to ask them questions. Like, do you have any like tips or like, I don't know, like uh, a guide of how to ask the right question? Like how to, how to, I mean, if we want to make the question a bit uh, wider, like maybe how to frame your story or how to frame your article to ask the right questions to the to the interview with uh <laughs> that's a hard one as well <laughs> that's a tough one <laughs> that is a good one so yeah so they tell you like one of the rule is try to have open ended question not yes or no like i mean when i talk about a solution or when i try to understand how a solution works or when when something works i can ask very detailed questions exactly and like one of the questions i love to ask is can you get me through the process of it like how did you install it uh, how 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 much how long did it take you to install it was it hard was it not hard how, how are you using it um like literally get me through the process like it's one of the things that allows me to go step by step to really understand how the solutions work and what the problem is. But after that, like um, 
one of my main rule is ask open-ended questions and listen without judgment, which is not easy. <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh, we all have a tendency to judge. But if you want to really understand other people and, and their lives and what they do and, and everything, like we need to create a safe space for them to feel comfortable with us and trust us with with their lives, with their daily lives and with their thoughts. So creating a safe space means no judgment. It's very psychologically um, inspired, let's say. It's, it's inspired from psychology, but but it's it's the way to go. So obviously, if you're talking about figures, you don't necessarily need to create the same environment as if you're talking about mental health or or, or stuff like this. But that would be my main recommendation. Open questions, no judgment. Now, to be more specific, the Solution Journalism Network did uh, write down a list of, I think, 22 questions that you can ask to get more or less the four pillars. Uh, I can find the link and send it to you if you want. Um, after that, you can build on these questions. You can decide which ones work for you, which, don't want, which ones don't work for you. But you do have some people who are working on what are the questions that work for Solution Journalism. Yeah, I think that would be that would be useful for for us. I mean, and for for anyone, like yeah, I think that's I'll check a, it right now and I'll send that's it. That's a you. nice yeah, it's a nice resource. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any other questions from uh, from the people in uh, in the audience. I don't know if uh, we have any other questions for MJ. If not, we will uh, we will go to the to the winners <laughs> <laughs> to the award ceremony. Okay, so I guess there are no more questions because no one is raising their hand or, uh, <laughs> or uh, dropping any questions in the chat. So thank you, MJ. Thank you for uh, for these insights. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, it was very. I think it was very very useful, and uh, it's always good to talk about uh, about this. I mean, these new uh, angles and new perspectives uh, on the journalism. I think it's. It's a fresh, <laughs> fresh view. So uh, we will go to, as I said, the winners of uh, this uh, very tech uh, uh, award. Uh, we should uh, be having Maya today with us from Veritech, but she she couldn't join. So so we'll just I will just go ahead uh, to give you a bit more of context for those of you who are here today. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, in I mean, in collaboration with uh, with Veritech, that is a it's a Lebanese uh, incubator and under the Act Smart Innovation Hub initiative, funded by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Lebanon, we did a training. Uh, like we provided a training for uh, for a Lebanese journalist back in uh, beginning of February. And from that training, we, we follow up with the, with the participants, uh, with a mentorship uh, to support them in the creation of, a, of a, I mean, of a, an article uh, to be published around the topics of agri-tech or clean tech, so water, energy, food, and environment. Uh, I mean, these are very relevant topics um, I mean, in general, but especially in, in Lebanon right now, like uh, finding solutions to this uh, to these challenges in the current uh, like crisis situation that the country is, is facing, uh, it's it's essential. And we had uh, the journalists working on the articles, and after I mean the evaluation, uh, the winners we selected the winner and the second uh, i mean the second prize but still uh, <laughs> both could be the winners because uh, both articles were were very good so the winner as uh, you might know uh, already is uh, marcel mohammed uh, we have her here i guess yes i will remove myself from the yeah so we had marcel who was the winner? I don't know. Congratulations. Can... Hello, everyone. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations, Marcel. Thank you. So, Marcel uh, wrote uh, an article about uh, solar energy in, uh, in Lebanon. So, how the solar uh, switch may put off electricity crisis in Lebanon. It's, uh, I mean, as the training was run 
constructive journalism and the stories that uh, you, I mean, Marcel and uh, all, the, all the participants were, were writing were uh, framing uh, the story with a, a constructive journalism uh, approach. She uh, <laughs> wrote this, uh, this story following, following all the steps of the, of the constructive journalism. And uh, yeah, we had this article published in the Transmina. We can share the link now. And the second place, uh, but still, as I said, uh, <laughs> was an excellent article uh, is for uh, Karim Monser. So we have Karim here today as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he also wrote about the uh, solar uh, energy so uh, in Lebanon so both articles were around the same topic that uh, I guess uh, I guess it's uh, I mean electricity is one of the biggest crises in the country now so I guess that's why the motivation but I mean you will explain further now so congratulations Karim as well thank you congratulations Marcel as well well deserved <laughs> thank you Karim for you too so uh, I would like to, to have a bit of insights from, from your side, I guess. I mean, to follow the order, we will go first with Marcel and then we go with you, Karim. So sure. you can share with us a bit of uh, like, how was the process to, to create the article and like uh, which challenges you faced? I mean, you can, you can, you can give us a bit of, of insights on, on how was the process. You can start yes, with you, Marcel. Can I share my screen? Sure, yeah, yeah, you should be able to share your screen. So I will I will drop the link to your oh, no, article I here. I can't share my screen. You can't share your screen? Okay. No, I need access. Uh, you can try now. Should be able. No. So I'm sharing the link here so you can all read the article of, uh, of yeah. Marcel and I will give you the floor. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, so uh, my article was uh, about solar system and electricity crisis in Lebanon. Uh, actually, um, I made a plan to talk with several people and several experts uh, about solar system and the electricity crisis in Lebanon. One of the challenges that I faced that many experts that had big plans for the electricity are uh, traveled and are actually living abroad. So I had uh, some challenge in finding an expert to talk about uh, the numbers and everything we faced during the past years or even before the, the economic crisis. Um, however, in the article, I tried as much as possible to explain the electricity costs and losses before the economic crisis in Lebanon, so before 2019, and some plans that some experts uh, who were uh, who were specialized in energy, uh, how, what were like uh, their plans, uh, the numbers that uh, that they talked about, how much were the losses? Um, like I mentioned, it was around 1.5 and 2 billion. Uh, dollars lost annually in Lebanon and everything that uh, the electricity sector uh, faced uh, before the economic crisis before 2019. Uh, after that, um, as you can see, I added some infograph in the article. I will talk about it uh, later on. After that, I talked about citizens' experience from different parts of Lebanon. Uh, so I have people from Shamoun, from Akkar, from Baalbek, from Kfour, and of course from, uh, from Beirut to talk about the electricity sh shortage before the economic crisis and after the economic crisis. In addition, they mentioned the prices they were paying for the uh, private generators. Because, you know, before the economic crisis, uh, we needed like less hours from uh, less electricity hours from uh, generators. Now we need more. So actually, also every uh, every region in, in Lebanon is paying a different uh, amount of money for the private generators with different hours of uh, electricity. Other than that, I, um, I talked about the solutions. Uh, first, with an energy expert, Ahmad Daher, he used to work uh, at the base, which uh, they had an, um, an electricity agreement with uh, Electricity de, de Le Bon. Uh, he talked about uh, how much electricity uh, Lebanon needs. Uh, 
it's uh, it's around 300,000 megawatts and he talked about uh, that uh, that uh, the the generator or the electric net network in Lebanon the governmental electric network is only providing around 1500 megawatts uh, up to 2000 megawatts so we have a shortage that is coming from the Lebanese governmental electricity other than that, I talked about the solutions. I talked with two startups, uh, made the Zoom interviews with uh, Rayan al Sariah. She is the CEO at the G4W team. Um, she had uh, a prototype and uh, she won several contests for uh, wind uh, turbines. Um, she is planning now to uh, establish them in several uh, parts of Lebanon, including farms. Uh, and uh, another person I talked about, uh, I talked with is Wael well, Zmerli. He is the CEO of uh, Azka Solar. He provides uh, water heaters uh, on solar system, which is also uh, a solution for many people, especially outside Beirut, because they don't have hot water to uh, to take a bath. Uh, I also talked uh, about all. Um, all the agreements that Lebanon did, as you can see, said International Monetary Fund, IMF, uh, and uh, how Lebanon already he agreed and promised uh, to work on solar system. At the end, uh, I mentioned uh, several uh, tips for if, uh, if any individual wants to uh, put solar system in his house. Uh, and the most important thing that I concluded, or at least that uh, I, that I or any other reader would conclude in the article uh, is that solar systems that are now established in, in people's or individual's houses uh, are really good for them as an, as an individual. However, on a big uh, image uh, of, an, of a country, uh, it could be like a chaos. At some point, everything needs to be organized with the government, and this isn't happening. So at some point, we will be facing another problem with the solar systems that are established in uh, in, in home. Uh, that's basically it for me. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, I made an infograph with all the important numbers and uh, made some interviews with, uh, as I mentioned, Rayan al sariah and Wael Zmerdi. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah, I I wanted to ask you, like, following the the conversation uh, before with with MJ, like, which challenges did you find uh, in the fact checking? Like, I mean, you said you had some maybe some issues finding uh, experts because they are abroad, or uh, like, which challenges did you did you find uh, maybe checking the the figures or. Uh, I mean, finding, yeah. finding uh, of course, the right regarding, sources. Yes, of course, the first challenge was the experts. The second challenge, as we all know, that uh, the Lebanese government's or ministry's websites, they don't provide a lot of data, a lot of numbers. You can't find the numbers on their websites. So uh, I was trying as much as possible to find numbers from other uh, from other like international organizations, like for example, IMF, World Bank, and uh, uh, others like that, because all the numbers that are present on the Lebanese uh, governmental uh, websites are really old. So that was one uh, of the challenges as well. Um, other than that, uh, I think uh, everything went smooth because actually I used to work on uh, on the electricity crisis years ago. So uh, other than that, everything was uh, going smooth. Okay, and regarding the constructive journalism, uh, journalism framing, like I don't know if, I mean, how familiar you were with that before the training or not, and how I mean, maybe challenging or not challenging. Like, how how was it writing the story uh, it with was this? Framing? A little bit challenging to provide a solution. Um, Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, even when startups, as you can see, I mentioned two startups that they are yes. providing a solution, but actually they are providing a solution for not the whole problem. As you were mentioning before, uh, or I think MJ was mentioning before, we are giving a small solution for small communities. Uh, so basically that was it. But if we want to talk about the solutions, the two startups that I uh, talked with, one was uh, for the solar or for the electricity problem for farms and for areas that are out Outside Beirut. This was at some point challenging, but at uh, another point is really beneficial for because as we all know, usually the capital Beirut has all the interest, all the caring from the government or anything like that. It was really interesting to talk about uh, other uh, communities. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, this was somehow a challenge just to tell people, uh, even, even if we are providing solutions for small communities, it's very important. We have to explain that they live in, um, in, like, uh, uh, in far away areas and they need care more than, at some point, more than Beirut because they are facing harder problems than the people that, we, uh, that live in Beirut, mainly in the when I talked about or when I mentioned about the people's experience and electricity shortage in different mm -hmm. areas in Lebanon, I was trying to tell or to show um, to show the reader that the people that live in Beirut, even with the with the economic crisis, have more at least options to do uh, other than um, other people in uh, other areas don't have. So yeah. this is also a challenge, but this is very, very important uh, to, to show to, to the readers, uh, as I think. Okay, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's clear. I don't know if there are any, any questions from, uh, from the audience, from uh, other, maybe Karim, if you have any questions. If not, we will, we will go with, uh, with you and uh, we, can, we can also have another round of, of questions at the end. So no questions. Okay, so we can, uh, Karim. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, thank you. I mean, the article was was nice, and I mean, uh, it's it's really really nice the insights that you're sharing. And very, I mean, very interesting. I think we could we could keep talking a bit longer, but uh, let's give the floor to to Karim. So. Thank you, Marcel and stop. Marta. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And congratulations again, Marcel. <laughs> uh, so my article, let me share my screen. Sure. So your article was also about solar uh, energy. Exactly. About, that was PV, published about in... solar PV uh, systems. About... Exactly. Can you please just uh, ah, yeah, give sure, me access? Sorry. Yeah. sorry, Karim. No problem. Sure. Uh, now you should be you should be able to share. Cool. Okay, can you give me access to the second account that I'm sending <laughs> from the lab? Okay. Now? There we go. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And this is it. Okay, so for my article, I decided to follow the sun. That was my title. Uh, maybe because I missed the sun in Lebanon. It was, uh, <laughs> the weather wasn't really good. And at the same time, that was the issue in solar uh, energy and PV systems in Lebanon. So the thing, uh, as usual, like uh, I started with my topic, I decided to discuss my topic in a way where I do my research, first of all, uh, because as uh, MJ uh, said, like uh, reaching quantitative news and uh, quantitative stats in Lebanon, it's really tough, it's really hard. Nothing is uh, written. Uh, the sources are usually like, uh, no, they're not specific at some point, okay? So I had to go for the qualitative part. Uh, my documentary actually helped me a lot in doing this process and choosing the people, uh, my research part as well. So I decided to uh, do my research, then a documentary about it. And after that, I moved to a research paper before moving to a journalistic piece, a journalistic article, uh, because like whenever you are publishing something on a website, at some point, in order to present it in a journalistic way, uh, editors have to remove some points. Uh, other than that, it would be a pure research paper. At the same time, the research paper helped me in, uh, in reaching quantitative uh, and quantitative data at some point, because you have to go uh, for Lebanon, what the agreements Lebanon signed, the government, uh, the Ministry of Energy in this country. So I started with a brief about Hassan Kamal Sabah, a Lebanese, uh, a Lebanese uh, engineer, who at some point decided to uh, light up the whole Arab region by putting solar PV systems in the Gulf area, where there's a lot of deserts, and decided to invest over there. So he went for the States, and uh, his project didn't work, but he was purely Lebanese, which was uh, which was a thing. Uh, for sure, I went through the uh, why don't we have you know, why, why why there's an electricity crisis in Lebanon uh, was a brief uh, about it. Uh, like eventually, everyone knows right now that Lebanon 
we don't have 24 uh, hours of electricity, 24 7 hours, hours of electricity due to governmental problems and due to policies and due to other types of agreements. So, with this brief, I decided to move to the solar port in Lebanon and uh, if it's able to implement such a solution in Lebanon. Uh, so whenever we talk about this, we have to mention the, how many days, uh, how many sun, sunny days do we have in Lebanon, which was the thing, because like we have about 320 days um, of sun in Lebanon. So it's, it's, a, it's a perfect uh, investment in this country. Okay, and especially that the public agenda at some point is talking about switching and swifting to solar energy. So like at some point, both problems came together and uh, here you can think about like yeah it, it can be implemented uh, then i moved to implementing larger scale systems in order to light like like marcel said like beirut is overpopulated at uh, many places and people on the roofs like uh, the roof is shared by the whole uh, building so this was a problem in beirut and here i had to talk about larger scale systems and how to implement that and i had to refer to uh, nova energy lebanon a huge company over here that work on such a problems on such uh, large scale systems. So they provided a lot of solutions. Uh, and uh, over there, I understood that there are two types of solar energy, the centralized and decentralized, and the importance of building a centralized uh, company, energy company in uh, near Beirut in order to, uh, to supply the whole, the whole region with, uh, with the electricity. Uh, I talked about uh, the functional grid, where people have to, uh, where people have one option where they have to install batteries. The difference between the batteries, lithium batteries and acid-based batteries, uh, the difference in the price of such batteries, and why do people pay more in order to receive uh, that battery? Um, I think this was a like an issue from from inside the Lebanese home. So whenever you go and ask people inside any Lebanese household, they would ask you some questions. And I, I did that before doing my documentary and my paper as well. Like I, I decided to ask random questions to people so that uh, to see what are the issues or how would they tackle such a topic, uh, especially during this financial crisis that the country is passing through. So it's, it's a huge investment because uh, you don't have access to your money. At the same time, you need to, to invest the amount of money that you saved throughout the dear life. So uh, the perspectives as well, I decided to go for uh, how did this thing change through history, not history, through the Lebanese eye, like uh, from 2014, where people had like 15 hours of electricity, then to 12, moving to eight hours per day. And today we have like two hours of, of uh, ADL in Lebanon, which is nothing. Uh, Okay, and the standards. So once we mentioned the term and decentralized or unregulated solar revolution, because at some point there is a solar revolution, whenever you look at Beirut specifically, because I live here right now, I can see like random, the randomness in installing such, such a huge systems and, uh, and this requires a metal grid. So it's, uh, it's unsafe at some point, like anyone, you can see them on the street, anyone can go and install the uh, a system without following any regulations at some point. So I decided to discuss this topic as well, uh, how to follow standards, what websites might help to follow such a standards, uh, who to refer to, uh, the amount of money, like whenever people ask about, like, there's a lot of high competition in the prices. So the reason behind the, this competition, I guess the financial crisis is, is an answer, but at the same time, the quality of what is the household installing. This was an issue as well. It was it ranged between like three thousand to uh, ten thousand dollars to a random household? Uh, so yeah, apparently this was what, what like this was mentioned in this article shared by Beirut Today. Uh, again, I referred to uh, my documentary inside uh, the uh, twenty-one minutes documentary inside my article because it's more specified. It's more uh, like this can be an opener. This article can be an opener to a huge topic 
And if someone is serious about it and he wants to know more about how to install such a system specifically in Lebanon, because as a Lebanese person, I know the, uh, the hardships that anyone can uh, go through. And in the documentary, I decided to go to like a huge uh, refrigerator warehouse where in Bekaa Valley, where he was, uh, he decided to go fully solar. And it was the strongest step from him, a huge investment. Uh, visiting uh, a villa in, uh, near Alay, a place near Alay. That was, uh, I did that as well. Visiting random households, like uh, the ones who are not rich enough to build such a huge uh, uh, system. Like I decided to go for several options in order to choose, in order to have a vast idea about the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's not all mentioned in the article, but uh, the documentary can can lead to some place. Like if a Lebanese person decided to build uh, solar, uh, to go solar, uh, by watching and reading about it, like some people, for me, for example, and MJ mentioned that, like my... Uh, my uh, verbal memory isn't that strong, okay? So I depend on my visual memory a lot. That's why I go for filming. I go for observing such issues because once you observe something, for me at least, I can't forget about it. And uh, so the thing in the, what I did is that people will have two options, either option A where they can read and understand about the solid uh, uh, power and how to install a PV system and the visual place where they can go for a documentary and they can observe experts talking about uh, the issue uh yeah i think so i think it. it's a uh, it's interesting that uh, you're mentioning that because uh, i mean we are i mean we are talking about journalism but journalism it's not only written pieces like uh, we can have exactly. also, no, as you're saying audiovisual uh, article i mean pieces or uh, i mean any other like even a mix as you are doing here like we have mm. a written article plus a video like uh it's it's also another way of communicating and maybe more impactful as as you are saying like depending on uh how the reader or the or the audience uh is um is uh, i mean it's uh, i don't know processing the information let's say uh i wanted uh, to ask you like a bit more about how because marcel was mentioning like it was hard to find uh like solution provider let's say for this general like for the general issue of uh, of uh, solar energy you know like it's easy yeah. to find like small scale but large scale it's, it's a bit harder like you are talking about large scale like how yeah. was it the process to to find like solution provider for that like what solutions at some point i had to go for uh, investors in lebanon or people who have direct uh, relationship with the world bank or the with the imf so lebanon made an agreement with IRENA, with UNDP, with Centro 4 agreement. Uh, I decided to go through names inside those research papers and research uh, uh, data that we, that we have. From those names, I decided to contact the people directly. For example, Mr. Mark Ayoub uh, or Jessica Abed. Those are experts in the field, in the Lebanese field, who understands what's happening in Lebanon, what the, the real issue behind the electricity crisis. To find a solution, Again, like the government, at the end of the day, today, you can tell that the government failed in finding a solution. That's why in my article, the solution is the decentralized solution where every single person in Lebanon has to do his own solar power, has to be independent about uh, from the government to go fully independent. Other than that, uh, we have to wait for governmental solutions which is with the never happen in the near future. Yeah. So yeah, I guess. that's why in my end of my article, I I ended it by saying that people have to go this like the decentralized solution is the best solution for the for Lebanon. And it's not my opinion. Again, I avoided my opinion at many points because I'm not an expert in this field. I'm a journalist at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but according to what the people and experts said in my uh, interviews. Like the decentralized solution is the fastest because at the end of the day, we need electricity. I don't care from where it is coming from. Uh, if it's a gas, if it's a fuel oil, if it's uh, uh, like, you need electricity. That's the issue. How to get electricity in the fastest time. The decentralized solution is, uh, is the solution provided by experts. 
other than that, if, if there's anybody out there who trusts the Lebanese government to do them a uh, fast, fast, faster solution, yeah, then I, good luck with I guess that. I guess that's <laughs> hard. But I mean, as Marcel was uh, was uh, also mentioning, like I mean, it might be a bit yeah. like I mean, it might be a problem that we face in the in the near future. But I mean, of course, like uh, that's and why I mean, not? Like later on, I also mentioned that like. Decentralized solutions, for example, in Australia and Turkey and Europe as well, like households began in Germany. The people began, like, they, they sell their electricity to the government, okay? Yeah. The, that was a decentralized solution, not a centralized solution. Like from a household, from the energy that comes from the sun, at the end of the day, they see what, uh, what amount they did. The access of energy, they just sell it to the government. So yeah. this can be a governmental solution as well. Yeah, of course. It's just we just need the willingness from uh, from the yeah. government to, <laughs> to implement <laughs> it. I yeah, not to go to too away too far away from the exactly. <laughs> from the journalistic I topic. I don't of, want to go, to yeah. go there. But uh, I also wanted to to ask you about. I mean, as I as I asked Marcel, like I don't know how familiar you were with the with the um, constructive journalism uh, angle and uh, perspective, and like if you applied before, but. Uh, I don't know, like how how was it to to write, keeping in mind like these four pillars and uh, and trying to write yeah. a constructive piece, or like, to film a constructive piece. <laughs> film and write about it. Yeah, at the end of the day, while writing about this, I had to keep the four pillars in front of me. So whenever I uh, like I go out of my topic, I then just look at the pillars and I decide to follow them. It led somewhere. I'm not gonna say no. It's, it's perfect. Uh, so many places. Like I decided to avoid my own angle. I decided to go uh, to experts. I decided to go to people who own the generators and ask them questions. Uh, the four pillars was a track at some point. You know, it's, mm -hmm. the track is there. Just follow it. Just follow it. But uh, again, you have to choose the right people in this track. So that was a great start. Uh, like they. Four, the four pillars are essential at some point. Again, not for forgetting the uh, like the data. The qual you know, you ha whenever you have a track, you have to go qualitative. You have to go down and ask people. Quantitative data is important, but in Lebanon, it's it's hard to receive like adequate data. So that's why I had to go qualitative at the. Uh, my first step was, was the qualitative research, and then I moved to the quantitative where I went through IRENA, I went through the UNDP, uh, through Sadro 4, and uh, the agreement with the government. Uh, uh, so, yeah, um, the limitations, if I want to talk about the limitations, it's, uh, mm. so I, I, I didn't find it like tough to reach the people because people are discussing such topics uh, in Lebanon. The thing it was with the cost of such a such systems and how to apply that in Lebanon, how to get the funds for such a huge uh, project. Uh, so the limitation is financial for most of the households. It's not uh, because everyone in Lebanon now has has an idea how 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 is it done, you know, how and they have in background information about this topic at some point. Uh, Again, it was a new topic. It was a new angle to discuss uh, stuff, especially with the news fatigue uh, that MJ mentioned in Lebanon. Uh, it was quite interesting, informative uh, for me as well as a journalist. It gave me a way, of, a new way of thinking and tackling uh, such topics. And right now, I have another documentary, and I'm going to write about it as well. It's about waste management. So I'm trying to uh, tackle it. In a similar way, that I tackled my old topic, which was solar energy in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting what you're saying, like uh, that it's it's a track. So that's it is a track, that, that's definitely. useful, I think. I mean, uh, that's, it, it can be useful. also useful for, for other journalists, like to follow to follow that track. I I don't know if uh, Marcel, if you're still around. I mean, if, uh, if you can uh, talk. I also wanted to to address you a final final question uh, from my side. Like, why did you choose that topic? Like, what was the importance of that topic uh, of that topic for you? Like, um, why solar energy and not any other 
challenge i mean uh, i don't know like problem or uh, any other solution that you could find in yes. your topic well basically solar system because uh, it is a solution it is also an environmental solution which is good uh, for climate change worldwide but on the other side uh, uh, as i mentioned before everyone almost not everyone almost everyone in lebanon is establishing solar systems in their houses i wanted to know if the solar system that they are establishing is going to be good later on for the future years uh, this was very important for me to know because people should know that at some point the this organization, as we say, between the government and the citizens and the um, non-governmental organizations is at some point uh, going to uh, to to like uh, to uh, to maybe explode at some point. And uh, despite everything, the citizen is going to, uh, hopefully not, but is going to get through more problems in the future. Mm -hmm. And for you, Marcel, like why, why did you choose this topic and not any other? Uh, for me, no, that, was, okay. that was me. <laughs> ah, Marcel, That's sorry, Karim. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the thing, uh, why I went for this topic, at some point in Lebanon, we've been... Uh, We've been observing the Lebanese agenda for too long uh, with no solutions or nothing. I decided to go wide, to go for the global agenda at some point. The global agenda, we are talking about uh, water crisis. We are about to face a water crisis by like 20, 30 years. We are about to face a waste, waste garbage and garbage crisis, especially in Lebanon. Uh, and at the same time, reality. Like in Lebanon, the reality is that there's no electricity. Whoa. Like that's, that's, like in order to do other types of topics, we have to start from electricity, from, from internal. Uh, so it, the reality was an issue and the global agenda at the same time, like after observing the global agenda, I was like, oh, like there, there are serious issues happening and about to happen. But we've been uh, talking about like the same news in Lebanon and the Lebanese agenda for too long with no solutions. So that's why, like I said, I need something with a solution, something that we can implement in my household, for example, and observe that there's a change, you know, because, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, actually reality alongside the global agenda. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing, I think that's, that's yeah. interesting to hear why, exactly. why the topics are chosen. So I don't know if there are any other questions from uh, from anyone around here, like uh, if you have questions for, for Marcel, for, for Karim, uh, if not, I will give the floor to Maya. Which is uh, which is uh, here. Um, she can. She will do some closing remarks. I don't know if you can. Yes. Can, can you hear okay. me? Yes. yes. Uh, let me. I guess. Hi, can... Karim, uh, Marcel, and everyone who and everyone who took part in this uh, very, I think, fruitful and beneficial competition. Awal Shimabruk, congrats. I'm very happy to, uh, to meet you and I look forward to working with you. Uh, first of all, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Beritech is focused a lot on sustainable solutions and on helping, supporting early stage startups and SMEs in Lebanon to come up with our own solutions and fix all the issues that Karim, you were mentioning and Marcel mentioned as well, starting from solar to food security to agri innovation and to everything that we can start doing locally to substitute uh, uh, import and to also even boost our export in order to revive the economy. So uh, we have more than 30 programs who are focused Um, okay. These issues specifically, these two years ago, asked for requests for programs to work with SMEs and to work with startups on the ground, which we are doing, which also is another aim of this competition and this partnership with Revolve is to support in the content part in raising awareness and writing about this and investigating and in presenting with solutions and
we are we are losing you, Maya. Your connection, I so think, is I not. So I am very happy to say that I will turn. Yes, I think that would be better. Yes, okay. I think so. Okay, great. So I am looking forward to working with Karim, Marcel, and potentially also. Uh, other journal personally to set a meeting physically next week and of course as we said before the prize is going to be you selected to become the designated freelancer uh, like who writes around this topic for very tech as we are growing our media outlet and growing an arm that is focused on journalism and feature stories and coverage so um, Again, congrats and uh, looking forward to this. And I will be in touch in the next two days. Thank you a lot for the Revolve and the Amwash team. Marta, Martina, Patricia, you've done an amazing job. Uh, sorry if I missed anyone. Uh, it was a great pleasure working together on this. Thank you for your support and thanks for everything you've done. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I hope uh, you could all listen properly. Yeah, I also wanted to thank uh, Patricia and Martina that uh, I forgot to introduce you at the beginning. That was my mistake. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Uh, a big and, uh, thank you also to MJ, to Marie Jose yes. for uh, support. <laughs> a big one goes to you, MJ. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yes. So I think, uh, I don't know if you have, uh, if there's any other... Uh, questions or if uh, I don't know if you have MJ or any comments remarks for for Karen for Marcel or, or, or in general if not uh, we will leave it here so if there are any comments yeah MJ I see you want to talk <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to say congrats again and um, thank you and one, one thing like when I was listening to Karen and, and Marcel's um, answers actually to a question like one thing that came to my mind is that it does show that no solution is perfect like you have solutions to problems none of them is perfect it's going to have its pros and cons and then at one point it, it's up to people to the, it's up to people to decide like which pros they want to have and which cons they're ready to bear at a later stage but i find that interesting like this duality like nothing is perfect but we have solutions what works what doesn't work um I really thought about that when I was listening to you, Karim, and, and Marcel talking about the different approach. Mm. Thank you very much again for everything and congrats. Thanks to you, MJ. So I think we, we will leave it here. I just wanted to, to, I mean, to say thank you to all of you that participated and congratulations again, uh, Karim and Marcel. And just a final remarks. So going back to my, to my opening, like uh, of what, Amwash, uh, I mean, it's, it's trying to do building this community of journalists and I mean, focusing on impactful communication, we, we keep on working with, with the journalists and I wanted to share with you the, the following uh, opportunity that, uh, that we have open. Uh, we will be working with the, with the World Bank as, as also as, as partners with them, like uh, along with them on a training uh, on, uh, on the, within the framework of the, of the Innovate for Climate. I think my colleagues are, are sharing the link here. So the call for applications is, is open until this Friday for journalists based in the, in the MENA region. So please, if uh, you are, uh, I mean, if, uh, if you find it interesting and relevant, uh, it's open either for uh, senior, so more than two years of experience and more junior journalists with some track record on environmental reporting, but I think uh, any of, of the journalists that participated in, in, this, uh, in this event and in the, in the training uh, could be, could be uh, eligible. So feel free to, to share it and to apply. And I mean, I will be happy to, to see you there again and to keep working together. So I think uh, we can do it here. Thanks Thank you. Can you, you Marta, please just share yes. with us the link via email as well? Yeah, yes. sure. Uh, they, I mean, the my colleagues share it here, but of course we will we will follow up. Uh, it's a, it's in our it's in our website as well. So I mean, perfect. You perfect. can okay. you can find it everywhere now. <laughs> but, uh, but we <laughs> okay, will share it. Good. We will share it for sure. Yeah, we will share it my email because uh, yes. it's more. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Thank you a lot for of everything course. for the uh, whole uh, webinar. Actually, thank you, Moya, MJ. Uh, 
like uh, I think that we have a similar experience, me and MJ, in filmmaking and uh, in journalism as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for the information and because uh, usually people won't share such a, such a good information with others. Thank you a lot for everything. That's it. Thanks to you, Karim. It was it was really great to to work together, and I mean, I hope that's just the beginning of uh, <laughs> the collaboration. Okay, so so we leave it here, and I uh, hope to to see you soon and to to keep working together, as I said. Bye bye. And, uh, bye, -bye. Thank, thank you, you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.